Thank you. Um, I have to thank you uh, not only for introducing me and inviting me to this wonderful conference, um, but also for having given us a chance to uh, clean up our, um, our system, change. This is what it takes to change, to tell people to not come with a PowerPoint. That <laughs> it, does, it does exactly that. The fact is that you can do a much better job. Still, of all the speakers today, you can see who's the prof. I've actually given you a sheet which has an outline of what I'm going to talk about. And I really think you should have it in your hands now because I would like to uh, try an experiment on you. At least something that might convince you that I'm not just going uh, out of my melon, as they say in Italy. So, uh, while you're getting the pages, I can simply say that I have taken the challenge of the storytelling request seriously. Um, and you all know this, so I can read it even while you're walking. Any kind of change begins in people's heads. Here's where it has to emerge and develop. We need narratives to get this going and to accompany us as it proceeds. And we've just heard a wonderful narrative. Narrative that update or replace old cliches and outward patterns of thinking. One that anchors our identity not only in the past but in the future, in that which you want to accomplish. I've taken that, I've taken that challenge seriously. But of course, my, my narrative, as you will see, is a weird kind of storytelling. Anyway, my reason to ask you to have the paper with you is that I'd like to try this experiment right now. I'm going to give you a few minutes to read this silently. Just read it. The argument, right? Just read the argument silently. Okay, are we all right? I'm gonna read it. It's all about language, and it's all in your head. Every time the main language supporting system changes, so does the head. The dominant system today is the digital. The change from oral to literate was to silence language and privatize the head. The change brought by electricity to language is to exteriorize language again and share our heads. Historically, mankind seems to have evolved between eras of transparency and of opacity. Fostered by the virtual extension of our most intimate aspects, i.e. big data, the era of transparency is returning in full swing. Henceforth, we must occupy and learn to manage three different spaces. Physical, mental, and virtual, all connected, but functionally, if not structurally, independent. The virtual is the new one that affects both our identity and our social position. Our identity markers fill databases and most of our relationships are conducted via a screen. The question is once we have become transparent, 
what kind of ethical order would have enough consistency to oppose tyranny? All I want you to reflect upon is the difference of the meaning experience that you get from reading it by yourself, reflecting on it, introducing within your own mind the content of the text, reimagining it, doing all kinds of manipulation to get to the, to the quintessence of the meaning, and then you get it orally. You hear it differently. It has a different kind of bias to your mind. So that's, what I'm, that's really basically what I want to talk about. That's my narrative. It's a, it's a narrative, and I'm, I'm really grateful to Panache because he just told me what kind of narrative it is. It's a narrative of a very large code switching. Very large code switching. And the people who were switching codes were not aware that they were doing it, so that's what makes it problematic. Right, so what you've got on the second page, or rather it's on, at the end of your first page, is a kind of quick and superficial but structurally useful analysis of the codes. So we're dealing with the three supporting media. We're dealing with the body, your body. Your body is a medium, it carries language. This is all media that actually affect language and that use language and position language in relation to us. So you've got the body, you've got paper right in front of you and you have electricity which is in your pocket and it probably has a screen. So the social structure that comes along with the body is a collective tribal, God, King, Father kind of relationship. The body is in real time. The body is producing language and it, the language is shared between bodies. It's all talk. On paper, what happens is, you, is what you did before, which is you silence language. Silence language. My God, it's, it's a tremendous power. It's, it's, it's very powerful to be able to read and write for sure, but to be able to keep the language silent and keep it to yourself. Language, and eh? not just ideas or experience of context. How you deal with, your, with yourself. So that creates a person. That creates an individual. That creates the illusion that, in fact, we are unique, which we probably are in some ways, but not in all. Creates a society of brothers. We can get back to that a little later. Hence now we talk about connective, network, and the new sort of social structure is a civil society. What's interesting about a civil society, it's a new concept beyond the society of classes. It's an interesting thing. The civil society is the first global possible society. All the other ones have been class-based. Meaning is based on context, on the voice, in an oral context, obviously. Whereas meaning is based on text. We have a religion of text, particularly in the West. And it started early. Law, what's written. And now we're moving to hypertext, which is a very different kind of relationship to meaning and formation of uh, uh, one's mind. What's the psychological structure? Well, the psychological structure of a community is a community. What's important? I was totally fascinated here, and I wrote it down <laughs> from Panache. When you get married, you know, it's two families that get married. It's not just a couple, it's just not two people. Well, that's what it is. That's, that's a community is based on exactly that kind of strategy, that kind of formula. And it's very powerful, and it actually guides everything. I remember last time in, um, in Ars Electronica, there was this wonderful woman from Senegal who, said, who asked everybody who can remember the name of their grand, the, you know, the family name of their grandmother. Everybody sort of more or less you know, raised their arm. What about the mother of that one? Oh, well, yeah, right, there were less people. What about the mother of that one? I was like, nobody, right? And so she said, well, in, my, in the way I'm brought up, I actually have to know to the seventh generation what their name was, where they were, and the cousins and cousins of those. So that's what history and that's what you know, memory is for us, and which I thought, well, all right, that's community. Instead, we have actually created systems that absolutely individualize the self, concentrate it in the, in the me. And it's very important to know that that is not a given. That's something that actually is created and it is supported by the media that we use. You know, I'm not a McLuhanist for nothing, of course. 
Um, and what's happening today, and it's this hybridity, hybridity between all our, uh, our experiences, hybridity between inside and outside, hybridity between me and the, and, the, and the city. We are into hybrid time, a hybrid time. We're selving, we're moving. Our, our, our being is not private anymore. It's not public exactly. I call it publicity, according to a word suggested by one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto, uh, Mark Feldman. Um, then there we have the vector of responsibility, and this is going to be important to understand where I'm going. A shame culture, as anthropologists tell us, is a culture that's, it's all about responsibility, right? So it's the responsibility of somebody who experiences shame comes from the fact that it's towards the other. It's in front of the other family. It's in front of the other clan. It's in front. You're constantly orient. Your responsibility, being community, is oriented to the other. If, not have, if you haven't been seen, you don't experience guilt. It, it just hasn't happened. If nobody has seen it, you're not really guilty. You, may be shame. you might have a remnant of shame, but you won't be guilty. Guilt comes in when you bring in shame. And you reorient the responsibility. Suddenly you have a destiny. Suddenly you have a personality. Suddenly you are really somebody different from the others. Now you are going to be guilty. So it's a very different kind of, that's a big code shift. It's a big code shift. And now, you see what I'm talking about in hybrid? It's the reputation capital. Yes, it's a buzzword, but it's also a meaningful thing. What's happening to our image online, whatever way it's gotten or created, has going, is going to have a, a much, much greater impact on, the, on our life as they, as, they, as they develop. So how do we see those new spatial and temporal condition? What we're seeing now is that space is, con what we see in the culture of uh, an oral culture, a culture without writing, without documentation, space is not isolated from the body, from the person, from the living. Space is continuous. We know this from, from, from uh, Canadian Indians. For them, they don't walk in space. They just move and space goes through them, which is an incredible concept. And we have proof of this, it's been studied. The idea of space of an American Indian or a Canadian Indian at least has been traditionally that space traverses them. They just exercise their movement. Whereas we are in a Shakespeare theater, we're always somewhere on a stage, just like you know, we're always on a stage. We're actors, as he says, individual actors. Whereas in the, you know, sorry, and the, 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 but the space, the space within of the space of the stage in our self-oriented culture is neutral, it's empty. There's nothing in it. It's just movement. You have, they don't think about air, they don't think about light, they don't, it's just like the idea being that space is infinite and neutral. It's not neutral anymore. There's nothing neutral about the space in which we are. The virtual space is not neutral, it's constantly attached to us and extends us and actually informs upon us. So now space is continuous with the self again, and self connect, and, but that self is connected to other selves. We are now becoming nodes of a hypertext in our social configuration, among others, because of course we cultivate all the rest. But the, the option now is actually to extend one's being into networks and be referable to, and be dependable as members of these, of these texts. So how do we occupy the three spaces? Pretty, pretty well, the physical one, we all know very well how to do. We do have a training system for the mental one. We can handle it reasonably well. We know it's different from the, the, the physical one. Then we have this new hybrid, the virtual, which is partly a mental one and partly a physical one. But it's different from the other two. And we occupy it, and it is occupying us. And that's, that's what's important. Now, uh, this is where, we're, this is where the, th the plot thickens, I would say. Um, one way by which we are occupying the, that virtual space is the internet that you can understand now as a weird kind of social extension of a limbic system. 
from the time of uh, the Arab Spring and the Occupy Wall Street and all these movements that happened and that sort of tapered down now but will probably rise again, we've seen that the internet has played a role of transmission of emotion, of alert making, has basically played a role that our body calls the limbic system that carries emotion and that provoke emotions, bring it out to action. When you think about the danger it involves to actually confronting the army in, or the police in various countries where the Arab Spring happened, or even in the United States uh, confronting the police in Occupy Wall Street, you can imagine that the movement of emotion on the limbic system, which brings together all the other people, is, has to be pretty powerful, pretty solid. So that's, that's how we occupy the, the virtual. When I say virtual, of course, you, you understand, I mean, much the, the whole caboodle. We can call it digital, we can call it virtual. If I just said the electric, you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't get it, but that's what it is. It's really basically electricity in its various form doing it to us. So, <clears throat> how does it occupy us? Well, this is where the plot thickens, as I said, and I call that the digital unconscious. The digital unconscious is everything that's known about you or can be known that you don't know. So it's a problem. It's a problem because we have all these digital personas. I always say we need to have a, the Jesuit 2.0s because the Jesuit understood how to create education for people who had just been tortured by the alphabet. Now we're being tortured by electricity. We should have people who can teach us, you know, how to handle the education of our digital persona. We'll get to that again when I get to the end of my, my talk. By the way, when is that to be? Let me see. Uh-oh, <laughs> soon. <laughs> I, I think so. So I'm going to try and cut down on some of it because I would... Okay. Um, the big question following this is... Oh. Just make full use of Ars Electronica. There is at the Ars Electronica Center a lot of absolutely first-class things, very useful, think-provoking, but for me, and I'm always looking for new directions, that which is the, 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 the how would I say, the, the seed that is, that is going to reveal the future is in a small place on the first, on, first underfloor, the first one minus one, and it's a, an area where, in fact, uh, Paolo Cirio, Cirio has, ex, uh, has an exhibition which I really recommend that you give it a good attention to, uh, these guys, they are the artists that are telling us what's going on. They are the ones who are really, that's the new, that's the new for me, that's the new generation, that's the new charge. We've known the charge, all the charges have been here at Arts Electronica. Certainly I've been witness to a number of them. But that's a good charge, that's a good charge. Go and see it, it's a sort of a half of a room, on one side is the city, which is great too, but the one I'm interested in is the one, the first side of the room where you have five or six art interactive pieces, or not always interactive, that have an intense revelation power and make you really want to know what are we going to do with that? That's what I'm, that's what I'm about. So if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, the return of shame culture, one good news about it is that it was also the honor culture. Honor is an enormously important thing in cultures of shame. Just ask any Japanese person in, in, the, in the area, where it's a tradition of enormous, enormous continuity and, and, and respect. So it's very interesting to know that that's a kind of the other side of shame, the other side of shame. So what I'm, what I'm really, the big question is, it's how to avoid tyranny. Tyranny is at the door. Tyranny is at the door. When you have things like prison, and when you have things like the total survey of every one of us, I'm not one to, I don't, I don't even want to be an alarmist. I want to be simply saying, let's pay attention because the danger is real, that we can be taken for a very long and painful ride. Because, you know, power likes to do that. If you have power, information on each one of us is huge power. Huge power. And see who wants to resist grabbing that. And once it's grabbed, using it, 
and how long will it take and how many revolutions and how many times we will have to, you know, brace ourselves in order to recover beyond this? Or is it exactly that? What is it that's really happening? We are now into permanent confession. We just walk. Walking is a confession. Your, your cell phone, you'll see that. You'll see in the in museum, you will see that uh, they have shown how this happens, that wherever you go, it's your, it, your, your signal follows you and it's put somewhere and people can use it. Oh, come on. Don't tell you that, that's permanent confession. So, nothing to hide. What happens, what's the, what would be a ethics which would be consistent enough to be able to resist, at least ideologically, against the practice of tyranny? What would guide legislators to actually put in place some sort of agreement and code in the context of the type of transformation we are going through today? That's the question. That's really what I'm fascinated by. And what I'm proposing is very, very timid and, in fact, superficial, but it's just ways of thinking. One other thing is the ethics of security. God knows it's a pain. Surveillance is becoming normative. If surveillance is normative, then we're exposed all the time. Then we can fight it and say, we don't want this to happen. Take it away. There's lots of strategies for that. Or we can say, what's the alternative? How do we reverse the problem? How do we transform it? If an era of transparency is really happening, then an ethics of transparency has to arise. We have to have a social order that is going to function. And so I see <laughs> surveillance being normative. I see transculturalism, manners, Japanese style again. Japanese tell us about manners. It's very strong, very, very, you know. And it does create a level of social uh, equality. Benevolent aristocracy, I've described. No, I haven't described aristocracy. The thing is about aristocrats, it's a, of course they've been beheaded. They had to be. They completely lost their jobs. The aristocrats of the French Revolution were people who were just taking it for granted. They were just taking it like uh, Count Almaviva in uh, Beaumarchais uh, Figaro, who, uh, who tells him, uh, well, for all these wonderful things that you have around you, what have you done? You just gave yourself the trouble to be born. Well, exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly what the revolution was about. We have a problem now with exactly the same kind of tension. And it's not just, God, we know have enough tensions around the globe to know, today to know that we, are we have to deal with these things. No, I'm talking about the revolution, a tension within ourselves. So, uh, social ethic, how would you have? You'd have very good manners, remember Bourdieu on that matter. He, was, he, knew, he tells you how manners count and what they do and how this microcosm actually creates a macrocosm of social uh, behavior. Reversal of values. Now, that's, that's, that's a big mouthful. Reversal of values. Giving more valuable than taking. It's an old Christian vision, but it's not just Christian. There are many, many different kind of spiritual visions that approach this kind of thing by saying, you know, you keep grabbing, but it gets you nowhere. Give, and you'll see where it gets you. That may be in an aristocratic, a new aristocratic kind of way. That is the power of the better people, and the better people are better because they're trying. You know, we're not going to say anything. These people are actually trying. So we see a new way of understanding what it is to be in a transparent society. That's a reversal a situation. Instead of having everything you hide, we can't hide. We can't hide. We can run, but we can't hide, says the song. We can't hide. So what we need to do is to have a, a completely different kind of behavior. But not just a different kind of behavior, a different kind of feeling about what it is that we're doing with our behavior. And I'm not trying to be a moralist. I'm, a, I'm observing. What I'm trying to do is observing the kind of shape a social agreement would have, assuming that transparency is really understood for what, it's, what it is in our present condition. Transparency is language supported by electricity and penetrating down to the intimate parts of our body. That's what's happening. 
and are thought the same. They are working now on putting some doodads on your head that allows you by internet to send a thought, not written, not expressed, not image, to somebody across the Atlantic. So, you know, we're doing, we're doing experiments that are really, they are playing with our heads. <laughs> they really are. So that was the story of the, the, the idea of that change. An economic is ethic. I've, I, I somehow have, this is wishful thinking, that, you know, crowdfunding would become the economy of the future. We always invest in what we think is real or what we really like to see happen as opposed to simply having some other guy playing with money and playing the most disgusting game of money. Oh, thank you, Paolo Sirio, Cheerio, for your extraordinary exposure precisely of exactly that which we are suffering from. Wow, that's what an artist is for. Who's going to say that sort of thing if not it's going to be an artist? And we, he was asked by, by Gottfried here whether he felt threatened. Well, no, he doesn't really feel threatened, but his excuse was because I'm an artist. Right? I don't, think that, I don't think it's safe at all what he's doing. And it's not going to be safe to actually resist this. But we definitely have to have this kind of situation where we, in transparency, have a mutual, a symmetrical relationship with the transparency of the others, of the people who run our money, of the people who run our state, or people who run... That has to be symmetrical. Basta. Right? So here's my political <laughs> cry. Reversal of values, value-guided investment strategies, political ethics. Symmetry of access, transparency, increased consulting. I might, I, might, I might end here with this issue of the planetary ethic. Again, it's woolly, woolly thinking, okay? And we're not yet not enough convinced that we should actually really pay attention and really do something about it. It's not about that. I think everybody knows that and everybody has their position on it. No, the problem is if, we, if the whole issue is an issue of responsibility, then the question is, where now is the orientation of the responsibility? In the return of shame culture, with reputation capital over your head, with how now we have to be accounting for every level of our presence to the rest of the planet, where is the responsibility? And I think it's outside again, but it's as large as the community. Hence, it's as large as the planet. That's the reasoning. The community of a tribal situation is as large as the group, the tribal group. The community of readers is as large as the con constituted, you know, in number of individuals who are ready to come together and just share a few things. But the community, in its, you know, it can be dis dispersed, but it's usually still limited to face-to-face -face distance. Our communities haven't got these limits anymore. So that's what it is, the change of responsibility, the kind of reversal of within how we feel about things. That's going to have to happen as well. These are the various things that, I'm, uh, that I wanted to share with you, and uh, thank you. <laughs>